a real privilege and a great pleasure to be able to introduce our second keynote speaker, Peter Donnelly. Um, as several of the most influential scientists in our field, Peter is a mathematician by training, specialized in uh, applied probability. He obtained his bachelor's degree at the University of Queensland before moving to Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar. He was elected to a chair at the University of London at the age of 29, becoming one of the youngest professors ever in the UK. Note that I say all this without telling Peter's age at all. Oh, well, we <laughs> After holding a chair at the University of Chicago for two years, he returned to Oxford as head of the Department of Statistics first and then director of the Wellcome Trust Center for Human Genetics. He has made seminal contributions in coalescent theory, DNA evidence, recombination, and many other topics in genetics. However, as we all know, as architect and chairman of the UK Wellcome Trust Case Control Consortium, he has played a key role in setting the standards of genome-wide association studies that have revolutionized uh, medical genomics. Peter has obtained numerous awards, including election into the Royal Society and Academy of Medical Sciences, but I've been told, however, that possibly more than of his academic achievements, Peter is particularly proud of his successes as a rugby uh, player and captain. Peter's legacy in genomics transcends his own scientific contributions. If you are not already aware, you'd be amazed, as I have been, to discover how many of today's most brilliant and influential geneticists he has been the mentor of. Peter, thank you very much for being here today, and the floor is yours. Thanks very much, and thanks for the kind uh, introduction. It's a great uh, pleasure and a huge honor to be asked to give this talk. This meeting, the biology of genomes, probably more than any other, has played a really formative role in my academic uh, development. It's always nice to be here, and it's great to be here in this position. I want to talk a little bit uh, today about uh, recombination, meiotic recombination. I've chosen that topic for a number of reasons. The first is that I think the whole story is really fascinating. I hope to give you some sense of that, and I hope you might think so uh, yourself, if you're not familiar with it, uh, later on in the talk. Secondly, as an area, it allows me to illustrate, and I'll come back to this during the talk at a high level, uh, one or two points about the structure and the way the subject has developed. And finally, for me at least, uh, the work on recombination, our work on recombination is intimately connected with this meeting. Uh, many of the results that we've derived in the field were first introduced here at a series of conferences uh, going back to 2003. So recombination is clearly an important thing. Along with mutation, it's one of the two evolutionary forces which generates new genetic variations. So for those of us interested in patterns of variation in natural populations, it's one of the prime drivers. But completely separately from that, it's also mechanistically an essential component of meiosis. And the crossovers that recombination creates are essential for correct chromosomal segregation. When they don't work, it results in aneuploidy, which is still the leading cause of pregnancy loss and developmental disorders in humans. And I'll come back to this very briefly later in the talk. But there are versions of, of recombination, so-called non-allelic recombination, which result in exchanges between different parts of the genome and are responsible for duplication or deletion of relatively large segments of chromosomes. And in turn, those duplications and deletions lead to what have come to be called genomic disorders, dis diseases and conditions like Charcot-Marie Tooth and so on. And there's an intimate connection between those uh, and meiotic recombination. So although it's incredibly important, it's striking how little we've understood about the mechanisms of recombination. It's an area in which we know rather more now than we did 10 years ago, and I hope to share some of that with you. I think at a high level, the reason for that is my recombination fundamentally happens in meiosis, and meiosis is really tough to study. Mitotic cell division is easy to study. It's easy to study in cellular assays, but there aren't analogous assays to allow us to study uh, meiotic division and hence recombination. So much of the work uh, and many of the results we have to get indirectly rather than directly. Although I'll come back to that and some possibilities later in the talk. So it's been known for a very long time, uh, as has been mentioned in the meeting, from pedigree studies that recombination rates vary 
over very large scales, many megabases across human chromosomes. It's also been known for a long time that recombination rates vary between males and females. And relatively more recently, about 15 years or so ago, it became clear that in humans, uh, much recombination happened in very small regions called recombination hotspots. Individual recombination hotspots have been known for rather longer than that. In humans, the beta-globin recombination hotspot was discovered in the early 1980s. Aravinda Chakravarti uh, led much of that work. And a little bit earlier, there were recombination hotspots discovered in the mouse. But it's only relatively recently that we've known that these aren't uh, isolated events, that rather they're a key part of the recombination landscape. So one line of evidence for that came from studies of recombination in individual sperm. Here's a figure from a really nice paper by Alec Jeffries' group. Uh, so Jeffries looked at about 200, 200 uh, kilobases across the MHC region, assaying recombination in sperm. So this is recombination rate plotted against position uh, in the region. And what you see is a small number, six in fact, of uh, narrow positions where virtually all of the recombination happened. So each one of those is what we would now call a recombination hotspot. So those uh, sperm studies were exquisitely detailed in being able to give us insight into recombination at specific positions, but they weren't, and in fact still aren't, scalable to enable us to learn about recombination genome-wide. There was indirect evidence about uh, recombination in humans uh, on a genome-wide basis. So recombination is responsible for the breakdown of linkage disequilibrium. Because we inherit uh, chromosomes in pieces, SNP loci which are near each other, very physically close on the same chromosome, are typically inherited together. And those, uh, the genotypes at nearby loci are thus often highly correlated. That's what geneticists call linkage disequilibrium. And in a world in which uh, recombination happened uniformly along chromosomes, linkage disequilibrium would break down smoothly. In fact, it was observed again 14 or 15 years ago by Stacey Gabriel and colleagues uh, first at the Broad Institute that that isn't what patterns of linkage disequilibrium look like in humans. This is a figure from the HapMap paper, and each of these uh, regions are regions where nearby SNPs are highly correlated with no e many of them, and all of them show no evidence of recombination between them, and then there'll be positions, one here, one here, 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 and here, and here, for example, where there's evidence of recombination breaking down those correlations. And that's the pattern we would expect if recombination typically happened in these small regions called recombination hotspots. And I've just mentioned in passing, to come back to another uh, area I and many others have been involved in, genome-wide association studies wouldn't have happened when they happened had it not been for recombination hotspots. Had, it, had they not been in place, linkage to equilibrium would have extended over rather smaller distances in humans, and we would have needed many, many more SNPs and technologies which are only now becoming available to see disease associations. So having said that uh, recombination is responsible for some of the patterns we see, the breakdown of linkage disequilibrium in human populations and, and many other natural populations, the next stage from that, and it's something that uh, we had thought hard about, was the idea of using those patterns of natural variation, using patterns of the breakdown of linkage disequilibrium, to learn about recombination rates. So at a high level, you could imagine having some kind of mathematical model for the way in which populations evolve. Recombination rates would be a parameter in that model. You could then collect data on variation in, for example, human populations, and then try and estimate the parameter in the model. Actually, as you've heard, I'd spent a lot of work, a lot of my early career working on something called the coalescent, which is a particularly nice model for evolution, and then quite a bit of time on working out how to do inference, how to learn about parameters uh, in the context of the coalescent. And it turns out that that's really hard for any substantial scale of data. It's simply not computationally feasible. One knows in principle what to do, but it's not computationally feasible to infer recombination rates in a coalescent framework. So there are a number of uh, routes that have been suggested uh, around this, and broadly speaking, they all amount to approximating the coalescent. The coalescent is itself an approximation. It's one that many of us in the population genetics world have known and loved and studied for many years. It turns out not to be the right tool for analyzing large-scale genomic data. So a lot of progress has been made through approximations. In this context, I'll talk about something called composite likelihood. So it, it's very hard, you can imagine, uh, local region of a chromosome with SNP data. There are complicated correlation patterns between those across the different individuals. The breakdown in that correlation is where uh, there's evidence for recombination. That's hard to model directly. It's just possible to do that if you confine attention to a pair of SNPs, 
in a set of individuals. So the idea behind this approximation is that you analyze each pair of SNPs as if they are independent. They're not, it's a very gross assumption, but it turns out that there's still enough information in the data, even with this assumption, to be able to give reliable estimate, estimates of recombination rates. So I, I worked with Gil McVeigh, who developed a program and an algorithm called LD Hat for estimating recombination rates at fine scales, and with, we both worked with Simon Myers, uh, who developed the package to infer the presence or absence of recombination hotspots. So you can test these kinds of mathematical methods in a number of ways. The standard one is to simulate data when you know what the answer is, apply the new statistical method and check that you get something like the truth, which you know because you're simulating from it. We did that and it was encouraging. And the other possibility is to apply it to real data. So here's the picture I showed earlier of uh, the data from Alec Jeffrey's estimates from single sperm of recombination rates in this region in the MHC. And that was the answer when we applied the population-based methods. So it's one example, and it's one of the high-level points I want to make, where even though we've had to make fairly gross approximations in the mathematics and in the statistical analyses, there's still enough information in genomic data to be able to learn about key biological processes. So that's estimation over a small region of um, chromosome 6. We were able, when genome-wide variation data became available, to apply these methods uh, genome-wide. Here's a picture of recombination rates at a fine scale on human chromosome 12. You may not be able to see it very well, but there's a red line, uh, a relatively smooth, smooth red line at the bottom of the picture. That's what we had known previously about recombination rates from pedigree studies. So there's a much, much richer pattern of fine scale variation than we had previously thought. We were able to identify more than 30,000 recombination hotspots across the human genome, able to show that recombination occurred preferentially outside genes, uh, and also by various indirect methods to show that the landscape of recombination fine scale recombination in females was broadly similar to that in males. Having identified many recombination hotspots, not with absolute precision, not with the precision of the sperm studies, but still many of them with reasonable precision, the natural next step was to see whether there was a sequence motif that was responsible for the location of hotspots. Uh, and in a series of papers uh, led by Simon Myers, we identified, this is a version of the 13 base pair Degenerate motif, uh, CC almost anything, CCCT, uh, there's degeneracy here, and then CCAC broadly. Here's uh, data, if you look at instances of the exact motif, or, or exact subject to the degeneracy, in the genome recombination rates around those regions are very ele elevated. If you make uh, one change, you still see some elevation in rates, and if you look elsewhere in the genome, or, or make more substantial changes, you don't see that kind of peak in recombination rates. The action of the motif, or the motif being important, was confirmed in a number of different ways. Fortuitously, uh, one of the hotspots that Alec Jeffries and colleagues had studied uh, involved a mutation, so that the, the patterns of human variation in the individuals that he studied in sperm studies uh, involved a mutation in the middle of the motif, and he was able to show actually before we knew about the motif, that he was able to show that the presence of that motif uh, disrupted and substantially reduced recombination rates. We saw that the motif is active on different genomic backgrounds and rather more active on some particular backgrounds. And the motif itself turns out to be associated with a number of the genomic disorders I was talking about. So one of these is Charcot Marie Tooth, uh, where not only like homologous recombination occurs, where a fairly large chunk of a particular chromosome is either duplicated or deleted, it turns out that the breakpoints for that, um, for those deletions and uh, mutation, for those deletions and um, duplications, those breakpoints for many of the genomic disorders are substantially enriched in this motif. And in fact, subsequent work uh, by Alec Jeffries confirmed that it's a key part of the story and that individuals where recombination happens at other motifs don't tend to have sperm, because he was studying um, sperm still, don't have, tend to have sperm with those duplications and deletions. A, a side part of the story, again, related to this uh, meeting, I think, uh, announced here in 2004, was work uh, from Molly's group and a collaboration that we had with David Altshuler's group, which showed that, again, by looking at variation data in, in a small number of regions in the genome, that chimpanzees had recombination hotspots but that they occurred in completely different positions from human hotspots. 
So that at the time was very surprising. We now understand why that's true. But at the time it was extremely surprising because sequence similarity uh, is very similar between humans and chimpanzees. Here was some fundamental biological force that somehow was being directed to different places. I'll digress a little bit because it's a key part of the story to tell you about something called the hotspot paradox. So again, in, in work from Alec Jeffrey's lab, there were some individuals who had, so here's a part of the motif uh, we had seen, who had a mutation which disrupted the motif in this position. And Jeffries had seen that where recombination events occurred, instead of the usual Mendelian segregation, 50% of uh, gametes getting this variant and 50% getting that variant, where recombination occurred, there was very substantial overtransmission of this version, the version which stops recombination from happening. And it's possible to think about that. I'll, I'll try and give a kind of high-level version. If there are two chromosomes, it turns out that um, what the motif does is to enlist the machinery that causes double-stranded breaks in DNA. And that double-stranded DNA break is repaired, typically, from the other chromosome. So in the case where you have uh, two different chromosomes, one of which has double-stranded breaks much more often than the other, the one, the hot chromosome, the one where the double-stranded breaks happen more often, will have those breaks more often, they'll be preferentially repaired from the other chromosome, and the consequence will be that the cold allele will get transmitted more often than the hot allele when these recombination events happen. So it, it's something which had been noted in theory, and the consequence of that is that if there are sequence motifs which recruit recombination and cause recombination hotspots, those motifs will drive, this, this force, bias gene conversion, will drive those motifs out of the genome. And so the paradox is if you need motifs for hotspots, and once you have a motif for a hotspot, it, it will eventually get driven out of the genome. What does the system do then? We now understand that rather better. So having found the motif, it was a natural question to ask about the molecular machinery, what was binding the motif. It turns out that there's a gene called uh, PRDM9, or a protein called PRDM9, that binds at the motif uh, via a particular zinc finger domain. So we got to this route uh, again indirectly through evolutionary studies. Um, we used the differences between humans and chimpanzees to try and understand what might be driving that. Two other groups at the same time uh, through rather more classical genetics in mouse models. They had sh th there were mouse hotspots and it was known that if you change certain bits of the mouse genome, the recombinational behavior at those hotspots would change. So by a series of, of traditional uh, mapping approaches, they were able to narrow down the region and focus attention on PRDM9. And Bernard de Massey's group in this paper also showed that the, uh, the version of PRDM9 that uh, exists in humans, in fact, binds, this, uh, binds the motif. So that was quite uh, a major breakthrough for the field, finding uh, the, the one uh, high-level way of thinking about it is that this is a transacting factor which is responsible for the location of these uh, recombination events. So what does PRDM9 do? It puts down epigenetic marks. It trimethylates lysine 4 of histone 3, marks chromatin. Uh, incidentally, it's exactly the same mark that we know of in another context uh, in, in, in terms of uh, promoting gene expression. And also, uh, happily for us, uh, PRDM9 is expressed when you'd want it to be in meiotic prophase when recombination occurs. Just uh, diverge for a little bit. So when we found the sequence motif associated with recombination hotspots, that was the first motif found in any species uh, to be associated with recombination hotspots. It's striking, and it's one of the points I wanted to make, uh, that we found it in humans. And the reason is that it turns out that the very large amounts of human variation data that were being collected, not for these purposes, but largely for medical genetics re reasons, can allow really powerful insights into human biology. And this is one example I'd like to think. Uh, those of us who work on rather more complex organisms look with some jealousy on people who study yeast. There are all sorts of things they can do in terms of manipulations. But actually, the yeast biologists, while they knew a lot about hotspots, hadn't been able to identify a sequence motif. So it turns out that in yeast, um, yeast don't have a version of PRDM9. Uh, it, it's something called SET1, which is responsible for the location of uh, recombination hotspots in yeast. We've got SET1. That's the protein which is responsible via the epigenetic marks in regulating gene expression. 
So in yeast, the same protein regulates gene expression and is responsible for localizing hotspots. In humans, we've got two separate proteins, humans and mammals. There are two separate proteins. And one hypothesis is that the whole point of PRDM9 is to move recombination of events away from the epigenetic marks that are responsible for promoters. And because set one in yeast is not a zinc finger protein, uh, there isn't a binding to DNA, and so there isn't a DNA motif in yeast. Turns out, uh, aside from its role in recombination, PIDM9 is interesting for a number of other reasons. Uh, it turns out that in, and I'll come back to this, uh, in mouse, uh, PIDM9 knockouts are infertile, and they fail to repair double-stranded breaks. It's also really interestingly uh, the case that PRDM9 and it was discovered at, just before uh, PRDM9's role in recombination was identified. PRDM9 is the only known species incompatibility gene in, in mice, and in fact the only known species incompatib incompatibility gene in mammals. So one of the major uh, focuses of attention in evolutionary biology since Darwin is to try and understand the process and mechanisms of speciation. A part of that is uh, hybrid sterility, which can arise once species have started to drift apart to keep them apart. And so it turns out that PRDM9 is somehow, and I'll come back to it later in the talk, is somehow a part of that story as well. Not only uh, is it important because of its role in recombination and its role in uh, hybrid sterility, it turns out that PRDM9 is an extremely rapidly evolving gene, or to be strictly precise, whoops, to be strictly precise, the zinc finger part of PRDM9 is extremely rapidly evolving. Uh, work by Chris Ponting's group studied that over many, many uh, different phyla. So across about 700 million years of evolution, there's evidence for positive selection for uh, change in PRDM9. And just going back to the difference between humans and chimpanzees, we now know that the reason that uh, chimpanzee hotspots are in completely different places from human hotspots is that chimpanzees have a different set of PRDM9 alleles, so they bind to different places in the genome from human PRDM9 alleles. And actually, we now know that there are many different uh, PRDM9 alleles in humans. Caucasians have one, in fact, two very common alleles, but in uh, humans with uh, African ancestry, there are a range of different alleles. And so those individuals with different uh, PRDM9 alleles from the more common ones in Africa, they have recombination at different places in their genome from Caucasians. And it was Jeffries who showed that directly uh, and also showed, as I mentioned, that uh, individuals with the, one of the African uh, types of PRDM9 allele uh, don't have the kinds of changes that lead to Charcot-Marie tooth disorder and so on. So uh, just finally, by way of uh, review, I'll talk about some work more recently uh, in a collaboration between my group and uh, led by Molly and Gil McVeigh's groups where we applied the same approach, this idea of taking variation data and applying the statistical method to learn about recombination over a fine scale to chimpanzees. We were able to show that uh, chimpanzee, we could find a fine scale chimpanzee genetic map and when you compare the human map and the, the uh, chimpanzee map over fine scales, they differ uh, across the genome. Although recombination rates uh, between humans and chimps disagree over small scales, the hotspots are in different positions, actually when you look at recombination rates over larger scales, over distances of hundreds of kilobases or megabases, uh, this curve in our study shows that those recombination rates are much more highly correlated. So virtually all recombination happens in recombination hotspots. Recombination hotspots, uh, their locations are governed by PIDM9. Different PRDM9 alleles cause those hotspots to be in completely different positions. So the fine scale location of recombination is different, but there are separate mechanisms which we don't understand at all, uh, which are regulating the recombination over larger scales, and those are much more conserved. So this is an example of that from uh, chimpanzees. Similar observations had been made in mouse, and some of our studies of humans had also pointed to the same thing. Another nice thing about the chimp study very fortuitously, there's been a chromosomal fusion. So chimpanzees have two chromosomes, one's, one's called 2A and one's called 2B. And at some point on the lineage to humans, those two chromosomes fused to become what's now human chromosome 2. And so by looking at recombination rates on the two separate chimp chromosomes and comparing those with the human chromosome, we can learn some interesting things. So here's a, here's a, a 
a coarse resolution of that. So the grey line are re human recombination hotspots. Here's, this is over fairly large uh, scales, megabase scales. The red is recombination rates from one of the chimp chromosomes, the one that matches this bit of human chromosome 2, and the blue is from the other chimp chromosome. So if you look at the left and the right, you can see that the patterns are broadly similar. So that's the uh, broad scale correlation that I've already mentioned. But in this region, they're extremely different. The sequences are almost identical. But in the chimpanzee, uh, this is a telomere of chromosome 2A, and this is a, or 2B, and this is the telomere of chromosome 2A, and recombination rates are much increased. So again, it points to something over and above PRDM9 that's regulating recombination rates, completely different from sequence, con completely different from sequence content, but related to sequence context. context taking the same bits of sequence and making them telomeric uh, ra radically changes the amount of recombination. So I want to uh, kind of pause now and go on and talk about some more recent work and unpublished work we've been involved in. But again, just to make the high level point, we're actually able, uh, one of the striking things about this meeting and many uh, biology of genomes meetings is the extent uh, striking, and if you're a statistician, uh, encouraging. For those not statisticians, maybe not so encouraging. But the extent of sophisticated analyses which are now possible and can be extremely informative on data on genomic scales. And as I said, uh, we learnt rather more about recombination at a very molecular level in humans, indirectly through analyzing variation data with relatively sophisticated statistical methods, because there was lots of variation data available. So just to summarize or remind you of, of what happens in recombination, uh, very briefly, so there are two uh, pairs of homologous chromosomes. Recombination is initiated by double, programmed double-stranded breaks. So PRDM9 binds, we now know, binds to the DNA. It recruits uh, other proteins, in particular SPO11, which causes the double-strand break. There's then a resection, which leaves uh, a three-primed end. That's coded with proteins such as DMC1 and RAD51, which help strand invasion. So uh, this part of one chromosome invades the uh, duplex from the other chromosome. That uh, leads to the formation eventually of a double holiday junction, which can be resolved in two different ways. So it allows repair of the uh, pieces which have been excised. And it can be enrolled in, resolved in two different ways, one of which leads to crossover and the other leads to so-called non-crossover or, or gene conversion events where only a small tract. In a crossover event, you have uh, a bit of one chromosome attached to a bit of what had been a different chromosome. In a non-crossover event, uh, in a very small region, 50 to 100 base pairs, think, uh, you have a copy of what was on one chromosome inserted into the other chromosome. So now I want to talk about more recent work. I've said we got a long way uh, just by doing analyses in effect. Um, I'll now talk a little bit about how far we've got by doing actual experiments. One of the nice things about the center in which I'm based is that we have a very strong tran transgenics core. So someone like me who's never done an experiment in their life can talk to people who know how to do this uh, and they can do mouse manipulation. Rather amusingly, after we'd, uh, Simon and Gill and I had talked about the possibility of doing these kinds of experiments, we arranged to meet uh, the guy who runs the transgenic facility in the center. And as he was coming to the meeting, he chatted to one of his colleagues and mentioned he was coming to see us. And uh, the, uh, the guy in his group was rather surprised and said, why are you going to talk to them? And he said, well, I don't know, something to do with uh, transgenics. And then his colleague said, don't they realize we work with real mice, not the sort that are attached to computers? <laughs> uh, but we did realize that, which is why we wanted to talk to them, uh, about an experiment whose aim was to replace the zinc finger array of uh, a mouse strain, black six, with the zinc finger array from humans. So here's um, a schematic of uh, PRDM9. I've talked primarily about the zinc finger array, and we'll focus on that actually for the rest of the talk. That's the bit that binds to DNA. It has a set domain. That's what's responsible for the uh, trimethylation, putting down the epigenetic marks. It has something called a crab domain whose function isn't currently well understood. So what we did uh, was, uh, what we wanted to do was to replace the mouse uh, zinc finger array by the human zinc finger array from the, one of the common Caucasian alleles, uh, the B allele. Uh, and I show this simply to give you a sense that these zinc finger arrays are completely different. We use relatively standard techniques uh, to get the, uh, happily for us in the mouse, the zinc finger array is encoded in a single exon, and it's the last exon in the gene. So we simply replace the, uh, the wild type mouse exon 10 with the engineered human exon 10. 
There are various natural things you'd want to check uh, to make sure that nothing had gone horribly wrong. So in our humanized mouse, uh, PRDM9 was still expressed as much as it should have been. Uh, and you see expression of both the mouse allele and the human version of the protein. Uh, and RT-PCR in testes again confirms that expression levels are conserved in the uh, heterozygote and the homozygous humanized mouse. Uh, the mice showed normal fertility, which uh, turns out to be a bit more surprising than you might have thought for reasons we'll come back to. Um, so these are assays or counts from chromosome staining assays of double strand breaks, uh, and they're broadly similar across the homozygous, uh, the mouse, which is homozygous for the mouse allele, heterozygous and homozygous for the human allele. If you look at total numbers of crossovers uh, by MLH1 foci relatively late on in um, prophase in, meiotic, in meiosis 1, they're broadly the same. And actually, if you look at stains of, so this is phosphorylation of one of the histones, H2AX, that's a mark of double strand breaks. So late on, and I'll show you some pictures where this goes wrong uh, later, but late on you see only a small number of unresolved uh, double strand breaks, except for uh, the region around the X and Y chromosomes, the so-called sex body. So all, again, the um, heterozygous and homozygous uh, humanized mouse are looking as they should in terms of the mechanics working well. So having made the mouse, we'd like to learn about how recombination might be changed and what happens to hotspots. So it turns out that there's currently no straightforward way to assay recombination in a, in a genome-wide high-throughput way. It's not possible to assay, uh, uh, assay recombination, so crossover events in that way. It turns out, thanks to really uh, nice assays developed by Galina Petakova, um, that you can assay double-strand breaks. So they've developed a technique which is in effect ChIP-seq, but you have to work rather harder than ordinary ChIP-seq uh, for DMC1. Remember I said that uh, DMC1 is the protein which coats these single-stranded ends. And so the ChIP-seq technique uh, specifically focuses on these uh, bits of DNA, single-stranded DNA, uh, coated with DMC1. Here's a picture from uh, an IGV view of the ChIP-seq data. So these are in a sample uh, around a double-stranded break. This is one of the strands, the positive strand and the negative strand. And what you see are ChIP-seq peaks which aren't quite symmetrical. And the reason they're not quite symmetrical is because these uh, single-stranded pieces are not in the same position. They're offset from each other, as we'd expect. Uh, these two uh, tracks are a control sample where you get some binding of, um, through the ChIP-seq, but nothing at the same kind of level. So we developed a statistical algorithm to call peaks here. I won't go into it in any detail, but in effect you want to compare a model where the, the left, the center, and the right on the two tracks uh, are just showing background. You can estimate the relevant parameters in that model with a different model where uh, on the positive strand you see uh, reads in the center and to the left, but not to the right, and in the negative strand in the center and to the right, but not to the left. And again, you can estimate uh, parameters and do something like a likelihood ratio test to test for the presence of a, a double-stranded break hotspot. Well, we saw lots of them. Um, these are just counts of the numbers of detected, uh, according to some threshold, uh, DSB hotspots. In uh, the wild-type mouse, we actually had one, this is our sample of the wild-type mouse, and there was some other data from uh, earlier work in the Camerini lab of another wild-type mouse, which because the read depth was more, there was more detection uh, in one version of the human homozygote and two versions of the heterozygote. So large numbers of double-stranded breaks were discovered. What's the relationship between hotspots for double-stranded breaks and hotspots for crossing over? Well, we don't quite know. As I said, some double-stranded breaks are resolved as crossover events, some are resolved as gene conversion. But uh, a number of lines of evidence suggest that DSB hotspots, double strand break hotspots, occur in the same positions as crossover hotspots. So we would be expecting that by looking at double strand breaks, we'd be learning something similar to what we would be able to see had we been able to assay uh, crossovers per se. So what happens in the humanized mouse? Uh, there were lots of double strand breaks. They're all, or virtually all of them, 98.6% um, of them, are in positions which are distinct from the positions of the double-stranded break in the mouse hotspots. Uh, 
or these are all in mice, but in the mouse that has the wild type, P, wild type PRDM9 allele compared to the mouse that has the uh, humanized allele. You can take the humanized uh, hotspots and do a standard motif search to see whether there's a DNA sequence motif enriched in the hotspots, and there is, and actually it really closely matches the one that we know that the human allele binds to and had found earlier. And if you do the same thing in the mouse, you find a motif for the mouse, uh, which matches uh, an, an earlier discovered and identified motif. If you look for enrichment, uh, so this is enrichment of the human motif uh, in human hotspots, and you see an enrichment, but not in mouse hotspots, and you see an enrichment of the mouse motif in mouse hotspots, but not human hotspots. If you look at the mouse double-stranded break hotspots that we and, and the Camerini lab had found, and you compare those with the locations from ENCODE of H3, K4, ME3 trimethyl marks, they overlap uh, as you'd expect them to, but there's no overlap with the locations of the humanized DSB hotspots, nor is there overlap with uh, the trimethyl marks in any of the other tissues that ENCODE studied. And as we found uh, for recombination rates, there are correlations between, although the humanized hotspots and the mouse DSB hotspots are in completely different positions, so at fine scales, DSBs are happening in different places, when you aggregate the heat of those DSBs over larger scales, you see correlations, as we had in chimpanzees, in humans, and others had in the mouse. So that was encouraging. Uh, the humanized mouse kind of worked uh, mechanistically. The hotspots were where we would have hoped and guessed they would be. They moved to positions that matched the humanized motif. Uh, the comparisons I've shown so far are a mouse homozygote with a human homozygote. What happens when you look in the heterozygote? Well, it turns out there's something interesting. You might expect that in the heterozygous mouse, some of the hotspots would be where they were in the wild-type mouse, and some would be where they were in the humanized mouse. Well, that's broadly true, but it's not true in a 50-50 way. And in fact, about two-thirds of the hotspots above a certain threshold in the heterozygous mouse match the humanized hotspots, and only about a quarter of them match the hotspots in the mouse. So there's some kind of dominance going on. And in fact, that's more extreme at hotter hotspots, so at... Uh, the most uh, extreme hotspots, the ones that cause most double-stranded breaks, the dominance is even higher. Uh, there's a much higher proportion of human hotspots than there are of mouse hotspots. So this picture, the red dots in this picture, each one of the red dots is one of those uh, DSB hotspots we see in the humanized mouse, and the graph compares its heat in the heterozygous with its heat in the homozygous mouse. And what you see is almost a, a straight line, y equals x, but a slope slightly bigger than one, which says that for a typical hotspot in the humanized mouse, it tends to be a little bit hotter in the heterozygous mouse. But in contrast, these are the hotspots in the wild-type mouse. Those hotspots are substantially colder in the heterozygous mouse, uh, with the exception of some of the uh, most extreme ones. So what might be going on in terms of the dominance? There are two sorts of things that might be relevant here. One of them is that it might be that the humanized allele is just binding better to DNA. It, it may bind better to its recognition sequence than the mouse motif does to its. And the other one is that it may be the case, and in fact is the case, that there are many more motifs for the human allele in the mouse genome than there are for the mouse allele. That's not unrelated to the hotspot paradox. Uh, what the hotspot paradox does is it depletes from a genome uh, motifs associated with PRDM9 alleles. So I'll finish just by talking about, uh, the, coming back to the hybrid sterility I talked about earlier. So it turns out that there are a number of other crosses uh, which give the same kind of behavior, but I'll focus on a particular cross. If you cross uh, a PWD mouse from uh, Mus musculus with a black six mouse from Mus domesticus, two different uh, subspecies, when you do the cross in one direction, where the male's PWD and the female is black six, then males are fertile. When you do the cross in the other direction, a black six male, a, a PWD female, then the males are infertile. I'll just mention in passing, the females of both crosses are fertile. So the fact that uh, this happens, so what might be going on here, it suggests that there might be something to do with an incompatibility between something from black six and the X chromosome of PWD, because these males have only got one X chromosome, it's the PWD X chromosome. And as I would mentioned, it had already been shown that uh, the part of the story here was to do with PRDM9. So some kind of incompatibility between black 6 PRDM9 and the X chromosome from PWD. 
Interestingly, uh, the infertile mice have phenotypes very similar to what happens when you knock out PIDM9 in a mouse. Uh, there's a problem with formation of the sex body and DSBs aren't properly repaired. Something is known, a reasonable amount is actually known about the genetics of this in incompatibility and the high level version is it's jolly complicated. But recently, uh, the region on the X chromosome from PWD has been mapped to about 4.7 megabases. It's not just PWD, uh, X and PIDM9 which matter. There's stuff going on in other bits of the genome as well, which isn't so well understood. So a natural thing for us to do was to repeat the crosses instead of using uh, individuals carrying the black six allele, black six individuals with the black six PIDM9, redo it with black six individuals carrying the humanized uh, version of PIDM9. And so that this is the cross that would have been infertile had this individual had a black six uh, PIDM9 allele. What happens in the case of a human allele? The answer is it totally rescues fertility. Uh, here's some data on that. So these are the individuals who have the black six allele and the PWD allele who are infertile. These are four individuals, uh, five individuals, who have the humanized version of the allele, but otherwise everything's exactly the same, and they're fertile. And you can see the same thing, I'll just go briefly through this, through uh, staining. So this is the wild type black six mouse. This is the cross which would otherwise be infertile, but has been rescued. And here's a picture of a number of things going wrong. So DSB is not resolving, hence the uh, phosphorylated uh, H2AX very broadly, and no formation of the sex body. So what do we learn in terms of hybrid sterility from this experiment? The first is the only thing we've done is to change the binding part of PIDM9. So it suggests that the, somehow or other the hybrid sterility is due to where PIDM9 binds. And it's probably due to where PIDM9 binds in that 4.7 megabases on the PWD chromosome X. So a natural hypothesis is that the black 6 PRDM9 allele happens to bind and cause double-stranded breaks at something which is really important uh, for what's going on during meiosis. And that the humanized allele binds somewhere else and the problem doesn't arise. It's also interesting if you step back a little bit, the uh, standard theory in evolutionary biology is that speciation can happen through a kind of lock and key mechanism. The two subspecies have their own lock and their own key, and those kind of drift apart. So that after a while, the lock from one subspecies uh, and the key from the other don't work together. Well, the problem with that, th well, that kind of simple version, simple-minded version of the theory here, is that what we've done is we've taken the key, PIDM9, from black six, which differs from PWD uh, over about half a million or three quarters of a million years of evolution. And we've replaced it by a different key, which differs by about 150 million years of evolution. And suddenly the lock works again. So it's not as easy to explain in terms of, of some kind of, of simple drift. When we created the uh, humanized mouse, we did it in a way via a, a cassette exchange system, which allows us to create other models relatively easily. So they're underway. Um, maybe the subject of subsequent uh, biology of genomes talks. So we're making a version with the chimp allele uh, with a zinc finger array borrowed from a transcription factor, another version with no zinc finger array, uh, one where the zinc finger array is tagged by GFP to allow uh, both microscopy, flow sorting, um, and antibodies. And then rather more ambitiously, we've got three different um, strains where we're trying to replace, the zinc finger array is there because it binds to DNA. It doesn't bind particularly specifically. Something that does bind very specifically are talons. And so in one uh, series of engineering, what we're trying to do is to put talons in, in place of, of the zinc finger arrays. If that happened to work, it's kind of a bit scientifically, uh, a bit science fictiony. If it happened to work, uh, we then be able, because talons binding is extremely specific, we could engineer recombination in the mouse to happen wherever we wanted it to. And that might be quite helpful in, in typical mouse breeding experiments in, in allowing one to narrow down uh, regions containing QTLs. So I'll finish the, the unpublished work I've talked about to do with the mice. In Oxford, Ben Davis is the person who uh, deals with the real mice, not the computer mice. Uh, Edouard, Julian, Angela, and my group. Uh, Simon has been intimately involved in this as he has in all of the other work I've, I've been lucky enough to do in recombination. Uh, and Daniela and Kath did the chromosome staining and we had a collaboration with Dan and Galena's groups at the NIH. So I just want to finish, um, actually Michelle alluded to this at the start of my talk, 
I've been extraordinarily fortunate uh, through my career, or at least the last 15 years or so when I've been working more fully in genetics, in being able to work with an extremely talented uh, and great fun group of postdocs. And so it's, uh, many of them have gone on to stellar careers uh, in their own right. I was able, uh, both at the time we were working together and subsequently to learn a huge amount from them. Uh, and it's great to be able to say thank you. Here are about half of them. Um, but a half chosen so that all the ones who are actually in the room can be embarrassed by having their photos there. Uh, Carlos was almost in the room, but he's had to leave the conference. But uh, this picture of Carlos is completely unrecognizable from the modern Carlos. Um, uh, Molly and Jonathan and Jonathan and Matthew are here. Uh, and uh, it's great to have the opportunity to say thank you both specifically to them for all the help uh, and enjoyable collaborations we've had over many years. And also thank you to the others. Thanks very much. Just time for two questions. Go ahead. Oh. Hello. Uh, I have a question about the uh, PRDM9 allele B. Uh, as I remember correctly, the uh, PRDM9 uh, allele A is the major allele in the human. So why would you still choose allele B to replacement? Yeah, very good question. Um, I'd love there to be some incredibly sophisticated answer as to why we chose allele B rather than uh, allele A. They're extremely similar, and they bind to the same motif. It just happened that in designing the, um, the exon to be inserted, uh, he chose allele B rather than allele A. So it wasn't a, a deliberate choice. We, we don't think it'll make any difference because the binding properties are the same for the two alleles. So I was, I was curious, how, how does the hotspot paradox resolve then? Is this just driving the evolution of new PRDM9 alleles? Yeah, good question, and I should have uh, brought that out on the way through. So uh, the hotspot paradox says that if you have a motif uh, which is responsible for the location of hotspots, evolution will tend to drive that motif out of the genome. And in fact, a recent really nice work by Simon's group has shown that there's a clear signature of that uh, in many of the genomes of, of the organisms we've looked at. Uh, so that's kind of bad news. How does nature solve this problem? It solves the problem by PRDM9 evolving very quickly so that it starts recognizing new alleles. Um, I mentioned that PRDM9 evolves quickly. It evolves extraordinarily quickly. The zinc finger part of the array uh, is the fastest by a long way evolving zinc finger in the human genome. Uh, we don't know too much about why it's evolving as fast as it is. So obviously the hotspot paradox is, is at least part of that story. If your motifs are being driven out of existence, you want to change the PRDM9 allele so that they have new motifs. So that bit makes sense. But it's not obvious that you need to do it at quite the uh, rate that PRDM9 has actually been evolving. It turns out that the, uh, the exon in question in... The exon in question in PRDM9 is itself a mini-satellite, so it's very uh, mutable. So that, uh, that's part of the story about why it can mutate quickly, but exactly what's driving the rapid evolution, we don't think we understand well. Thanks. So just to unite the two talks that we've seen this afternoon, in many insects, there is no recombination in one sex. Do you have any idea how that is repressed selectively? No, sorry. <laughs> Someone else might, but I don't. Sake of time, I think we leave it here. Maybe I invite you to upload our.